We all have these things that we've navigated. But if we can share with one another and not let them define us, but have ways to navigate through them, not over them, not suppress them. You start with yourself, you work on that, you help other people closest to you work on themselves. And then from that, if we can affect a few people that then go and affect a few people, you can eventually, hopefully, affect the whole world. I love making people feel loved and happy. And so when I felt like I was the one sucking the joy out of the room, I didn't enjoy that feeling. Diversity is not necessarily a badge of honor, but a way to connect us. If you're a victim of something, are you going to stay in victimhood and wallow and allow it to affect your present and future? Or are you going to go, ah, oh, that happened. I got through it. Actually, I'm pretty awesome. I could probably take on anything. Which one's going to make you feel better in the long run? You know what I mean? So we always have really strong discussions as a team. And Robert, when you came up with the idea of our community as a whole, really getting to know Austin and I on a deeper level, it just, it struck us on a very profound heart-centered space because you're right. When you brought that forward, we don't always share our story or what got us to where we are. And then you being our creative director and having your own story that got you to where you are, we're like, let's let people see our team discussion. Let's yeah. just invite them in and talk. But you also have a way of getting Austin and I to share things that maybe we don't often. So if, if you can keep getting us to do that, especially in a forum like this, I feel like it's a win-win for, at least for us and hopefully for everyone. <laughs> I would do my absolute best. And the way that I was looking at it was like, AI is taking over everything, but there's only, there's one thing that AI is never going to replicate and that is human connection. And connection comes from relatability. Like you can ask ChatGPT, how do I go on a personal development journey? How, how do I master spirituality? And it will give you an answer. But will it give you that connection to somebody who's already walked it? And in that thinking, I pushed you, well, want to push you guys to share your story more so people can connect with you and see that you're not just spouting all this stuff that you've read out of textbooks or something like that. Like you're walking the walk and talking the talk hmm. when you do these podcasts. Yeah. And I love it because our team as a whole really does push each other to, in the most loving way, to step outside our comfort zone and constantly grow. And we want to do that with our community as well. It isn't just our team, it's our community, mm -hmm. but it has to start with us. And that's well, something- It's a ripple effect, say. isn't it? Like yeah. you start with yourself, you work on that, you help other people closest to you work on themselves and then from that you if we can affect a few people that then go and affect a few people you can event eventually hopefully affect the whole world that's the idea at least <laughs> exactly <laughs> all right so where do you want to begin lead us robert well in the past couple of weeks we have come across you two having some blocks uh, around things that you talk about that I wouldn't have really have, have expected and I would like you to discuss them to show people that you're human and you're not just like some spiritual guru who sits on top of a hill and is totally zen 100% of the time like you're like the people that we're trying to help um, so if we start with you Amber the block that we found was that you don't talk about your story very much and like the advice that you give is kind of a, at a high level like you can tell I can tell at least intrinsically that you have gone through this but I'd like more detail so one I'd like to know more about your story I've in the past couple of weeks I found out some more which is great but I'd like other people to know more about what you have lived and then kind of 
a little bit of discussion around how, well, why you may not share that so openly so often uh, up until this point. Mm-hmm. And then maybe what we can do to change that moving forward and uh, how we can get you to share from this point on. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a tall question. <laughs> a lot of questions in one, but. Well, starting right at the start, like give us a synopsis of the life of Amber and what are the, I don't know, the key points of like struggles that you've been through and overcome that have made you the person that you are today. Okay. So I always say I've lived probably 15 lifetimes in a single lifetime. And at a certain point, I I stopped sharing because it was almost hard to believe that any one person could navigate through as much crap as it seemed my life kept throwing at me. And so I was like, all right, how do you even summarize all of these different phases and stages of my life? And why would I desire to place that on someone else? Because it felt so heavy every Mm -hmm. time I would share it, not just for me, but for the people that I seem to be sharing it with. And when I felt that heaviness, it was, it was hard for me because I desire for everyone to be happy. And I love making people feel loved and happy. And so when I felt like I was the one sucking the joy out of the room, I didn't enjoy that feeling. And I didn't enjoy the feeling of reliving moments. Mm right and i'll i'll share some of my story obviously it's a lot but i've had multiple sexual abuse in my life i have gone through um whew, even saying it out loud it's like whoo i have gone through multiple bouts bouts of cancer because i held so much of that in and and didn't navigate through, like I never, after the sexual abuse, I didn't get the help that I needed. And not because I didn't love myself, but because we just didn't know, right? When you come from a background where there isn't an awareness or education around how you navigate through such things, and it's just, you just keep on going. Don't Mm. let it affect you, just keep on going. Well, there's no possibility that something like that cannot affect you. It affects you. And then it starts to affect your physical health because your mental health is affected, your emotional health is affected. So eventually your physical health becomes affected and it just layers stress and it layers stress. So I eventually, at the age of 21, when I was a newlywed and had just found out I was pregnant. They do all those tests and I found out I also had cancer. And that was just like a huge bomb went off in my life. And I needed to figure out part of that, you just keep pushing through, you just keep pushing through mentality actually did me well in that moment. Because when I was told by the doctor, you should abort your child and go through treatment, I was like, ah, I don't think so. There's got to be another path that doesn't involve taking the life of my unborn child so that I can live or that I end up passing away so that my child could live. There has to be something different out there. And so I really started looking into what it means to be human, like that whole intricate puzzle from spiritual to mental to emotional and physical and how it all blends together and how other cultures deal with this. Because what I was getting from Western medicine was definitely, you have to do it this way. There is no other option. And what I found was there's so many options. You know, choice is one of the greatest gifts we have as being human. And when we're told this is the only way you have no other choice, that's the moment you should perk up and go, uh, n- no, mm. no. Well, Counts is a very lucrative business. Mm. They don't want 
people getting better from it in the way that's available if you look in a little bit deeper like radiotherapy and chemotherapy if that went away a lot of people would lose out on a lot of profit and like people can say oh they wouldn't do that to us yeah they would they're making a lot of money yeah. <laughs> and people do get better just it's not the most efficient way so yeah and that's some and just to things. share a little bit just to know so anyone listening knows that i'm not like forcing you guys to do this and i'm not willing to do it myself like my dad had cancer uh later on this year will uh, mark 10 years since he was diagnosed like i've i've been through this kind of stuff as well as a family member not personally but i've i've been on the other end of rape basically so yeah thank you for sh sharing all that stuff uh sorry to have interjected yeah. please do carry yeah. on <laughs> It's, it's important that we all share too, because this is the mm. point. Um, and you help me realize it, that if I'm willing to open up and share, we all have things that have happened. Maybe it's not rape, maybe it's, or sexual abuse. Maybe it's not cancer. The other things I've navigated have been in my career and sexism or the different things that go along sometimes with that type of an approach. So we all have these things that we've navigated, mm. but if we can share with one another and not let them define us, but have ways to navigate through them, not over them, not suppress them, but actually take these tools, which is what I ended up doing, finding every tool I could possibly place in my arsenal, learning what they're good for and when to pull them out of my arsenal so that I don't become a victim of anything that happens in my life. I can understand what I can learn from it and how I can get through it so mm. that I don't have to keep reliving it over and over. And even this is a great exercise because if I'm still feeling it when I tell this story, that means I'm not through it. Mm. And, that there's and something still you said, um, just before made me realize kind of why I wanted to do this. You said that you you just want to spread joy in the room and you don't want to suck the energy out. And But there's two things there. Mm -hmm. Joy is a contrast. If you're joyful all the time, that's not joy, that's equilibrium. Mm -hmm. You have to have the bad times to appreciate the joyous ones. But then on the extent extension of that which is the second thing is that by doing something like this i would at least hope that other people would feel empowered that they can see you guys have gone through your own struggles and whatever they're dealing with now they can look to you and suvera and the heart leader podcast and be like these guys can get through it they're talking about what they've achieved i can do it too you know what i mean yeah and we really appreciate you encouraging this because sometimes, and this is life in general, you get so close to it that you don't see it. Can't see That's the wood from the trees. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of our goals with Sweet Vera is to not make it about us. It's not, it's, it's not about one person or a small group of people. Uh, it's been like that for thousands of years within humanity. And look where that's gotten us. For mm. the first time, we really, really need to, as a collective, recognize it's about every one of us. And we each play that puzzle piece in, in the bigger picture here. And so that's one of our blocks was sharing our stories because we never wanted it to be about us. And if we did share a story, yeah. we also didn't want to get in the trap of getting into trauma bonding because then that just keeps us in our story. It doesn't keep us moving forward. We get locked in and it becomes our identity. And then that's a whole other thing we have to flow through. So I feel like this is a great practice and tool for us. And, and yes, I, I did what Amber says, thank you very much, Robert, for, for holding space for it's us in this way. My pleasure. It's paradoxical though, isn't it? Like you need to use your story without getting bogged down in the trauma of it. Mm -hmm. So you have to have accepted what's happened, but use it to become empowered and to have moved through it. Because you can't change it. You can't change the past. And how you use the past is within your power now in this moment. So there's that element. And then there's also the element of using your story to empower others. So it is 
about you leading the Heart Leader podcast. And you lead by showing your story, showing who you are to then empower other people. So that like that's a fine line to walk and a, a balancing act that I think you're both doing a great job of. Mm. Anyway, welcome, Austin. Sorry, you haven't spoken <laughs> that, uh, up until then. <laughs> The block that we found with you was more about not wanting to share your story because I'm going to try and summarize this as best as I understand it. Please feel free, free to uh, elaborate or <laughs> articulate it better. <laughs> but I understand it that you don't particularly want to share your story because or the lifestyle that you currently live because you know so many people are in the world not able to live the life that you currently have. Can you, like I said, articulate and elaborate on that more and your story and why that might be something that you're not uh, so <laughs> enthused to talk about? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I definitely, I, I'm very fortunate because I, I did grow up not only with parents who, who really loved and support me in so many ways, but they were uh, financially successful and uh, provided me every opportunity I could have ever asked for, which is such a gift I'm beyond grateful for. Um, but I also have that understanding that, as you just said, um, not very many people get that experience. Um, and especially with me being an only child like that, I had all the, all the attention and really whatever I desired to experience or go for in my life, I had the full support uh, financially, emotionally, um, you know, the whole the whole thing. Uh, and so I was really, really fortunate. My parents would travel all over the country um, to to help and support whatever it was that I was I was doing. Um, and so, you know, I didn't it took me a while to recognize that very few actually had that because I happened to be in a circle where that's where that was kind of the norm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and through that process that really opened up my eyes as I kind of got older. Um, but I'd say kind of the first initiation of, of my start was, uh, when I was 14, actually I got struck by lightning and, uh, from that, was that on the golf course, that was on the golf course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, uh, I almost, I did, I almost died. I was with my dad and, uh, had a, kind of a, an epiphany, if you will, um, where I really, I only remember a handful of memories prior to being 14 years old. And so it was almost like a, a, a reset. And so the little bit that I have, I, I feel like maybe I don't align with that individual or um, maybe there are characteristics that don't align with me uh, as a soul, or at least how I feel I am. And so there's this um, disconnect in many ways. And so what that put me onto this path um, when I was in high school was through golf. And so I, th I feel that what I did was I ended up taking the identity as a golfer and placing that as my own. So something that was outside of myself, the results I was getting, um, I, I was really fortunate. I happened to be one of the top junior golfers in the country. I was traveling the world. A lot of the guys I played golf with are now on the PGA Tour. Um, and they're just amazing, amazing, awesome guys. So um, I'm really proud of what they're doing. Um, but uh, it was definitely an identity, something that I desired to be. And uh, and so for it was good in a way that I wasn't, it wasn't that I just wanted to be famous or, or anything like that. It was like something, I just really enjoy the game of golf. I loved, I loved it. And uh, through that process, I didn't realize how much I was making it my identity, my ups and downs relative to how well I played. And my value in life was how, how, you know, how well I played and whether I got a college scholarship, whether I got a full scholarship, um, you know, all of these were playing aspects to who I am and were determining uh, my happiness or sadness or just value as a human being. Um, even and my wasn't, grades. Uh, wasn't there some tying of wealth to that identity and like flying private and yeah. having bottles of champagne in clubs and stuff you <laughs> mentioned before? Yeah. And so... Uh, I was, that got elevated at a different point. Um, and so what happened was in college, um, I did achieve my full golf scholarship and playing D1 golf. And, I, and then I got injured. Um, I had a herniated explosion in my neck, my back, three cracked ribs, vertigo and psoas all at the same time. And I found out that I would never play golf again. That's what I was told. 
And so if you can imagine when your identity is tied to something like that, uh, the whole world, it felt like uh, just my legs got swiped around underneath me and everything came crashing. Um, and I felt like I lost everything. I was in my first point of depression ever I've ever experienced. And um, I almost had to restart again in a way. And it was like, I don't know who I am, what I am, what I'm doing with my life. If I don't know that I'm a golfer, then what do I do? And this was when I was 21. So I was just getting ready to graduate here soon. Didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. I mean, because my whole life path just got shifted away from me. And so I started seeing, you know, at that point, a lot about um, what it means to be a man and what the lifestyle a successful guy in their 20s. It was to be an entrepreneur. It was to, you know, have a new girl on your arm every single week. It was to, uh, you know, just throw money around and be at the clubs and have bottle service and fly private and have multiple businesses and, you know, everything that it meant to like, you know, wear really nice clothes and have a nice car and just all, all the things like that is what it meant to be a successful guy. And so I started to take on that identity and didn't realize the detriment that I was creating in my life. The hollow aspect I kept attempting to fulfill uh, was actually a void the whole time because mm -hmm. I had no connection to myself or any awareness of who I am or, or why I was doing any of this. The really only realization is I wanted it to do so I could be uh, famous and successful and have status. And that was the only thing that was important to me. And, uh, and then that's kind of, uh, by the time I was 25, I was again, back to that unhappy place. Um, so not very much longer, only a couple of years. And, you know, I had those, uh, perceived highs, if you will, where everything felt and looked like it was amazing because that's what it looked like to everyone else. And so I was vicariously living my life through everyone else's eyes and really missed the true value of what it meant to be me and live my own life, not from an egoic standpoint, but just from a true authentic aspect of, of that, hey, I'm a part of this world too, and I'm just as valuable as everyone else. And so I kind of had a realization when I was 25 and a uh, quarter life crisis, if you will, and uh, uh, just had that full reset again. And uh, that's when I happened to meet uh, my amazing love Amber here and she saw in me what I had yet to see in my own self and that was uh, such a gift that I can never never fully repay um, and it was uh, a way for me to pull back and reset again and recognize that uh, it all it all is from that place of authenticity and that self-love is a beautiful uh, way to understand who you are, not from that, you know, champagnes and, and bubble mm -hmm. bath kind of self-love, but from the true essence of understanding that, uh, that it's not something outside of ourselves that creates the value. It's something that we choose to experience within ourselves that we can express into the external world around us. And that is beyond value. Well, it's something Marcus Aurelius talks about. Look at that. I was crying at your story <laughs> just then. I didn't even realize my eye was watering. <laughs> Marcus Aurelius talks about never do what you're doing for the third thing. The first thing is that you do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. The second thing is that you do it because it feels good to do the right thing. The third thing is what anyone else thinks about it. Mm. And you never do it for the third thing. It has to be for the first two, mainly the first one. And when he first kind of told me that story, I was like, you're like a modern day Buddha. Because obviously mm. he was brought up in a palace, completely um, kind of isolated from, like you said, like you didn't realize there were a lot of people that don't have that kind of support and financial stability mm -hmm. from their parents. Then he went out, decided to live with the poor people, decided to choose poverty. And it was like, actually, this kind of sucks as well. <laughs> so then came to a point where he's like, actually, I can just live my life the way I can. And I don't have to be at the height of heights in terms of financial success. I just need to be true to myself. And if that comes with some financial stability, then great. And that seems to be where you're at now, right? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go back to another quote I, um, that we had shared is, is that um, 
and because of how I grew up and, and the individuals I've met, some are amazing. There's been some incredible, incredible individuals that have succeeded, not just financially, but in all aspects of their lives. Um, but there are m- m- quite a few um, who, through the desire to accumulate funds, really realize that they're so poor that all they have is money, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's that was... When I kind of had that awareness in my in my mid twenties, that was part of the epiphany that I had in recognizing the materialism and the desire to acquire wealth um, was just from a a really poor place. Um, mm. And I don't mean that financially; I mean that spiritually. Spiritually I mean, broke. Broke. Spiritually broke. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. When you had that epiphany, and just to preface this, on our call. Uh, last week Mm -hmm. your dad was in the background he popped up seemed like a lovely gentleman and you said that he was one of the most humble people you've ever come across when you had that epiphany in your mid-20s did it allow you to see how your father operated in a different way and you took on that like ah that's why he's like that Mm. did you kind of have that because I've certainly had that in my dad like I never understood his way of being while I was a teenager, especially. But now it's like, I realize how much influence he's actually had on me in terms of how to be a decent human and how to operate. And all of the things I didn't understand now have fallen into place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, I mean, he's, he's been my best friend. And he's, he's so incredibly wise and full of heart and care and love and just as humble as it gets. And he's been extremely successful in many aspects of his life. But I think one of the most beautiful things about his approach to life is that he's always learning. He's always growing. I mean, he just turned 80 this year and he looks like he's 65 and and he, he puts a lot of effort into it. And that's just something that I think is under the, and he's not out there like on social media, you know, look at me, look at me. Uh, I mean, mm. he really could care less if anyone else is, is paying attention to him. It's He's doing it from a place of personal growth. Like, hey, this is satisfactory to me. This fulfills me. And not from that selfish standpoint. It's like, hey, I'm. it's just, I feel like personal value, right? Recognizing that that's what drives him and strives him further and allows him to show up as the best version of himself. And so I see that in Amber exponentially. Uh, and that's why I'm so grateful that I have a partner in my life who who does the same, shows the same, and, and, and inspires me through that process. And, and that's kind of been my goal now is, is to how can, I, how can I be the best version of me not to show off or to show anyone, but just for my own personal fulfillment. And then how can that allow me to, to show up to those around me, those that I love and those that I care and the whole world. Um, and so that's where I feel like re- overcoming this block is so important for me. Because it is, as, as I'm just kind of talking about it right now, having that realization that it is um, me being able to share is just in a way that is like, I, I want to hear everyone else's story. I want to understand where they're coming from, why they are, where they are, and what their goals are moving forward. And so I can't fully connect in that if I'm not willing to do that too. Mm. And you can drive a Tesla without having to be an idiot about it it doesn't mean that you're showing off necessarily it just is like and if you're in a place where you can afford to have a tesla you're doing something good for the world because it's not using fossil fuels so yeah just throw that out there sorry amber what were you going to say i was just gonna say when we were talking about the ripple effect right and what you just talked about, Austin, is the primary example of that ripple effect that we really desire to get going out into the world. We, So many of us, and we hear it all the time through the community, feel like we have no voice to really make an impact in the world. But you, Austin, when we first met, your desire was to learn how I could be so freaking calm all the time. Yeah. Like that was one of the things he said to me. How can you be so freaking calm all the time? And so that's how our mentorship actually started. Mm -hmm. And then you started really accumulating all the tools that fit for you to shift your 
behavior in your life into a way that fit for you, not mirroring everything I did, but fit for you. Then your family was so inspired by the shifts they saw in you, where at first it kind of caught them off guard and they were a little, what is going on? Mm -hmm. But then the more they observed, the more they were just really intrigued. And that caused them to start looking into how they could do the same in their lives. And your dad, being the amazing human he is, he was like, how can I promote my own health? And he didn't just become vegan overnight because you became vegan. He researched. He looked at what would be good for his body, how he could do that. And he was inspired by your actions that had been inspired by my actions. And now they are both your parents are in a different place in their life. And they say that it was because they were inspired by you. So there's like this ripple effect that you begin to see. And then that does actually change the world. It isn't as though we have to go out there and be this massive voice standing on a stage with 10 million people. You know, we can do it in this slow roll effect. And that's what sticks. That's what truly Uh sticks because your lifestyle is different your parents' lifestyle is different, and it has been for years. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing to see. Yeah. I mean, and what you, I feel like what you just said is so important because a lot of people mistake unity for uniformity, and it doesn't have to be the same. Inspiration can, can be a wave and have many different faces for that. And the beauty is, is like the more that I've recognized my parents and the shifts that they've made, it then, and their, their, their shifts inspire me back. And then, and then when I shift, I know that has inspiration for you, love. And then, and then you, when you shift, then that inspires me. And then that shift inspires. Me. So it becomes this, that's the unity aspect. That's the tie in, in how we grow together. Um, and so we are affecting each other daily far more than we anticipate. Again, not from egoic, but from true unity, connection, oneness, and that love uh, that fuels. And that's a much stronger, stronger fuel. Then you get someone like Robert in the mix Mm -hmm. and he takes us to a whole new level. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope I've inspired you somehow. You definitely inspired me. Mm. What I like about what you guys are doing is the doing religion a different way. Mm. Like you don't have to just be in the box of, Christianity or in the box of Judaism or in the box of Islam like all of those religions have the same message at their very core most philosophy and most religions all do and it's like be good be good to other people serve other people and you'll feel good yourself like and that in a a sense could be described by the word love like that's all we need like so to be putting out content regularly with that is not divisive, because that's the thing. When you say you don't need to have 10 million people watching you from a stage, unfortunately, as humans, we're drawn to people who aren't fit for that purpose. Like look at someone like Andrew Tate. Like if you, when you were saying about when you were 21, Austin, and you had that thing of like what it's like to be a man. I can only be thankful and grateful for the fact that Andrew Tate wasn't around when you were 21 because you would have been sucked in mm-hmm. to that charade. So, like, there has to be people willing to actually, like, go against that grain of uh, divisiveness and, like, negativity, essentially. And for a long time, I was sucked into that. Like, I, I thought I was going to die at 27. I was going to play music. I was going to join the 27 Club. And then I had that epiphany that I actually I need to do something decent with my life. Mm. And here we are today. So, mm. yeah, I thank you to you two for being awesome and putting out stuff that goes up against that negativity and gives people an alternative to the crap that's available nowadays. <laughs> It's interesting. Yeah. Well, just in in one perspective that really helps me is that um, it's our goal is not to put down individuals who are in that space because, you know, hey, I've been there. And Mm. and so much like we don't put down people who are 
or, or, or depressed or sad just because they're not happy. It's like we, we have mm-hmm. these experiences to help us understand who we are. I wouldn't be who I am right now if I didn't go through that and have that experience. And so it's not about a judgment. It's not about right or wrong or, or, you know, this is the, this, there's only one way and this is the way. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just highlighting that we can all agree that things are just make sense when there's love infused. Mm. And, and, and then and, there is that alternative yeah like if you look at a lot of people that have come out of being neo-nazis like they realize that there's a bigger perspective available to them that they don't have to be hating on all these people and they don't have to be violent and it mm. takes more control and self-discipline to be calm caring and empathetic than it ever does to turn to violence and anger And in doing so, they feel better. So, like, people just need to know that that alternative is available because when you're stuck in... Neo-Nazism is a very niche, like, far end of the spectrum, obviously, but any end of that spectrum, like, you need to know that there's a different way available and it's there for you when you're ready for it and when you probably have no other choice because your life's going to go completely wrong if you carry on down that path mm-hmm. absolutely but like I said without judgment yeah you need tools for how that was always mm-hmm. my big thing when i first started in to this direction and i would be told like go within and i'm like what the frick does that mean like yeah, yeah. how how do you want me to do this and, you know, just just close your eyes and go within well, that's, that doesn't fit for me personally. Like I need a little more. So having, having resources and having tools that explain it in different ways, because we all have different learning approaches mm. too, right? Some of us are visual. Some of us are more auditory. We want to hear the instructions guided or otherwise. Some of us, we really need to read it. And so we have to have different ways where we're actually communicating the message, the hows, and can reach different people. So that, again, is where we would call on our community to like, hey, help us out. If we're not offering a how that's helpful, then tell us, Mm. right? Because that's what I needed. Absolutely. So Robert, how about your story? If we're all being vulnerable in sharing, what is one aspect of your story that you would be willing to share with the community? Like I said, I, I, my plan was to die at 27. I was going to be the next Jimi Hendrix or Kurt Cobain. I also was tied into the idea that to be in the music scene, you pretty much have to be an alcoholic, mm. which also tied into the void that I had. So... I, I came to the realization about six, ooh, six months ago or so, um, 18 months into sobriety, that all through that period, whenever whenever I was getting drunk, it was never to celebrate. It was never to have a good time, although that's what I tell myself. It was to numb myself because life was just too painful. <laughs> it always was because I grew up with ADHD I was never a normal kid you could say and then I got to a point where I could learn guitar I could grow my hair long and I could initially smoke weed but later on because I'm lazy and alcohol is more (laughs) easily accessible than cannabis in the UK I just get drunk and like I live bouncing from point to point being drunk being hungover waiting until the next time I could get drunk. And then that came to a head, like I said, just over two years ago now, when I was just continuing to drink for no reason, wasn't even going out to pretend like it was a celebration Mm. or a good time. So knocked that on the head. I'm amazed that it took five years from that realisation at 27 that I wasn't going to be a rock star to 32 when I was like, actually, I need to also realize that I shouldn't be drinking this much as well and um, that's one 
aspects that I'm very much willing to share. What else do you want to know? I'm an open book. Like I've in the past five years or so I've gone on that self acceptance, personal development kind of journey. And for the most part, I'm a whole lot better, but it is a journey and you can always get better no matter what. No one Agreed. hits absolute perfection because then they wouldn't be human. Agreed. Well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Got to walk the walk. Got You have to lead by example if you want other people to be able to share their story, to feel empowered by it no matter what's happened. Like you have to share that's even possible, right? Yeah. Agreed. We are not our past. That is one thing I have spent a lot of time focusing on is realizing that the only way I'm tethered to my past is if I give it power to hold me back there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it can't be changed. That's the other thing. So you have to see it objectively for what it was, which was what happened. <laughs> and I can't be changed. But there's a... a, a a phrase that I saw that I absolutely loved. I don't know who uh, should be attributed with it, but it said, uh, it's never too late to have had a great childhood hmm. because the past happened. Those events cannot be changed, but how you feel and think about them can be changed at any point. So it's yes. all about your perception of the past. So change that. And you can change the story that you tell yourself that you're tethered to. Mm. Like if you're a victim of something, are you going to stay in victimhood and wallow and allow it to affect your present and future? Or are you going to go, ah, oh, that happened. I got through it. Actually, I'm pretty awesome. I could probably take on anything. Mm. Which one's going to make you feel better in the long run? You know what I mean? Exactly. Is it your kryptonite or your superpower? Which are you going exactly. to make it? Sorry, I am such a nerd. But <laughs> I own that part of me too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, we're never we're never given what we can't handle, and that's part of the I feel the aspect of us understanding who we are through the experiences that we have. And to kind of circle back to what you said, uh, Amber, is in the beginning was that it's not about getting over it or suppressing it; it's about getting through it, and that's the way that we learn. And so, you know, if we're in the middle of something, it can feel like the worst thing ever. But how many times when we get on the other side, as you said, Robert, do we get feel empowered? Do we feel like, wow, I'm so glad. Well, one, I'm so glad that's done. Uh, <laughs> and two, um, you know, here I am on the other side, you know, uh, a, a better person. Uh, you know, that's more, more me than I've ever been. And that's a beautiful thing to celebrate and recognize what you're capable of. It's hard to move forward in the future uh, without a place of fear if you're not sure what you're capable of. And so mm -hmm. the more that you can recognize what you've done in the past, not as your identity, but to pull in the strength, the courage, and the confidence to achieve what you have yet to achieve in the future, you know, that's that to me is what's so exciting. That's what's inspiring. Exactly. Okay. And as a final point on that, yeah. I don't I don't truly trust people who've never been through anything. And also, they're not very interesting. If you look at the people who, like, you gravitate towards, they tend to have a really, they've gone through adversity and they've made something of that adversity. The people who've been born with a silver spoon in their mouth and never moved on from that, like... Not they're not interesting, you know. Yeah, that's <laughs> this is a total tangent, but that's part of the reason that I I have no interest in our royal family. Like, cool, you've never really had to struggle with anything. It's, I find it interesting about Prince Harry and how he's come away from the royal family because of being with Meghan Markle. That's kind of interesting, but as a whole, the, the royal family boring because they're not going through what the rest of us have to deal with bringing me back to why we did this whole exercise so you two could be more relatable as well <laughs> yeah no I, I definitely understand that perspective but you know there's a saying that the, the worst thing that's ever happened is the worst thing that's ever happened and so there's so many different variables i mean 
will never experience those who aren't royal will never experience what it's like to be royal. And so mm. there are different aspects of the worst thing that could happen uh, in each person's experience. And so uh, and it's so subjective. I, it is well. so subjective. Yeah. And that's what's yeah. part of the understanding of, of unity and recognition is that is sympathy, empathy, and compassion that regardless of what they went through, that adversity is not necessarily a, um, a badge of honor, but a way to connect us. Um, yeah, because yeah. if adversity creates uh, value, then we are still getting lost in the trauma bonding. It's only when we can rise above that and recognize that regardless of whose adversity, if it is adversity, then it is human. And then if it is human, then it is us. And from that, we can grow regardless of the experience. Because maybe they chose on a soul level to be that so we could be us or vice versa. And so there is no separation. That's only an illusion. We have to recognize that there is a bigger picture. And even if we don't understand it, we have to trust and allow and let the love guide us through it, that it is purposeful and intentional. Yeah. And it's a crazy comparison, but the movie The Breakfast Club, I think, does a decent job of showing that it is all relative, right? Because that whole focus of that movie was to show that no matter who they were, no matter what family they came from, they all had things that were mm. hurting, right? Mm. And But they were all judging each other as though they didn't until they realized that they all hurt the same. Mm. May have been from different entry points, but they all hurt the same. Mm -hmm. So. Well said. And I finally seen that, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> I know it's a classic. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely showing age, but that's okay. <laughs> I show my hand. Um, we'd love to hear stories of other people. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to share their story, we'll continue sharing ours. But, you know, we have lots of other great podcasts out there so we can have them watch and learn a little bit more about us that way too. And we'd love to learn about them through that. Agreed. All right. Thank you for hosting us, Robert, and getting us and poking us to get out here. We appreciate it. Not a problem. I hope this is the first of many. This has been fun. Yeah, <laughs> it has been. I agree.